As I mentioned the other day, what I would like to what I would like to speak about today is the the, the practice of the path of the greater individual of the, from the autobiographical verses of Good Deeds by Mikhail Dorje. And so, in re, in connection with that, I would like to speak about the the great encampment's rules about uh, rules concerning meat. And in particular, I would speak, like to speak about how the Eighth Karmapa and Mikhail Dorje prohibited meat and uh, and how the uh, Vinaya allows meat that is pure in the three ways. Now, I cannot s speak about the entire subject of eating meat today, so I'll have to speak about half of it tomorrow. But in general, <clears throat> But in general, in the uh, Great Encampment, there were uh, uh, very strict rules regarding meat. Regarding meat, but these strict rules regarding meat did not start during the time of the Eighth Karmapa. And this is an old rule or an old regulations or practice that was uh, started uh, practiced during the times of several previous Karmapas. So how do we know that it was practiced during the time of the previous Karmapas? There is a text by the ninth Karmapa Wangchu Torje called The Great Rule Book for the Great Encampment, the Ornament of the World. And what this says is that the examples of the King of Dharma Jung Dham Limpa, Lord Deshin Shekpa, Glorious Tong Wadundan, Kyawan Chuda Jatso are similar. In particular, they gathered only monastics around them And those who were included in the encampment could not have any meat, not even the hair of a deer, or drink any alcohol, not even as much as the tip of a blade of a grass. They performed untold actions of the higher states through the many customs of Sutra and Tantra and of the two traditions. After them, Lord Mikya Dorje did not waver some steeds and examples. Not only that, he also brought practitioners of these constant teachings into the methods of having revulsion, giving up the, the worldly activities and upholding the, the teachings through teaching, debate, and composition. He established new monastic committees, built statues, raised his students in Hadstons, and wrote treatises beyond our conception. He guided his students to have con confidence of examining the oceans of our own and other schools. His influence and kindness are indescribable. So this is what it says. Now, what this is describing is, the Drung Zamble means is a name of Robert Dorje, so Robert Dorje, Dishin Shekpa, Tong Wundun, and Chura Jiazha. So during the time of those four Karmapas, not, uh, no meat, not even the, the hair of a deer we could be allowed in the encampment, nor was there any, uh, any alcohol, not even as much could, as one could, would fit on the tip of a blade of grass. Similarly, there is a text called from uh, there's a text by Karma Chakme called The Worlds of the Pendata Jamyan from the North, The Faults of Meat, dis and Distinguishing What is Allowed and What is pro Prohibited. Now, what it says in this text is that uh, there are always 500 pictures with outer robes around Rupert Dorje. And he perfected the example of not allowing meat, not even the hair of a deer, to come into his sight. From that on time, most of the Dharma organizations founded by Lord Mikit Dorje had strict rules against meat. At Ningling Monastery, there was no rule against meat, but a separate meat with a vegetarian stock, a separate soup with vegetarian stock was made for the vegetarians. The Karmapa and the Heart Sons ate only vegetarian and never let any meat in their sight. In Gana Chakras, the meat was, uh, offering was eaten by everyone, and even the Karmapas and his Heart Sons ate a small amount so as not to uh, uh, violate some Samaya. Now, what it says in uh, in the Kalafan, it says, meat and kana chakra offerings were distinguished by the, to the words that Sutra Sanchez and Mahasiddhas and following the example of the great encampment. So what this is saying is that, as it said in the citation from the ninth Karmapa, Wangcha Dorje, from the time of the fourth Karmapa onward, It was uh, not allowed to bring uh, any meat, not even as much as the hair from an animal, into the great encampment. 
And so they gave that pure example, and from that time, the various incarnations of the karma uh, continued to uh, uphold, uh, pr preserve, and spread that example. In particular, most of the monaster monasteries uh, uh, founded by Mikudorja had very strict rules against meat, and there was, and there was a monastery called Nyingma uh, Monastery. Uh, this was a, a, a shadow that was founded by the sixth sh shamar, uh, Chukya Wanchuk. And Kama Chukme went to this, uh, actually, as he studied at this monastery and knew it very well. So at that uh, monastery, there was no rule against meat. There was a particular vegetarian soup that was made with a vegetarian stop that was made separately for the vegetarians. Likewise, the Karmapa Ching, uh, Karmapa 10th Karmapa Ching Dorje, and in his heart, sons included uh, Shama Chigi uh, Wancho, only ate vegetarian and never allowed any meat in, in their sight. However, when they had Gana Chakras, uh, even everyone who is uh, ordinarily vegetarian ate a small amount of the meat offering. <laughs> and even the karma up in his heart son, so as not to violate the secret mantra Vajrana, ate a small amount of meat. And so that is what it explains in detail. And so for, for that reason, if we look at these uh, sources, what we can know is that from the time of, of Rolpa Dorje, the uh, great encampment had become much larger and more organized at that time, as I explained the other day. And there are very strict rules about meat. And I think these strict rules of meat could be said to uh, be a distinctive feature of the great encampment. And I don't think it'd be too, going too far to say that. Now, uh, what source do we have? What clear source do we have and reliable source do we have to say that this uh, rule, these rules were originated during the time of the fourth Karmapa Rolpa Dorje? Well, in the liberation story of the Rolpa Dorje called Delighting the Skies, written by his direct disciple of Kama Kun Shun, it says, all the members of his entourage lift off the three white foods. If the bones of a slaughtered animal were seen in the places where the masters and disciples had seen, seated, they were reprimanded, not even the scent of actim and toxins such as alcohol was allowed to waft within the confines of the encampment. He brought everyone into uh, pure conduct. So here it says the entourage of Rolpa Dorje, but also all the people who are around him, they lived off of the three white phones. And when the, and when the, if the, uh, and when the master and the disciples saw, if they were to see the bones of slaughtered animals uh, when a camp was taken down, they would reprimand people. And there was no way to bring alcohol and intoxicants inside the camp. Likewise, there is a liberation story of Rolpa Dorja by his student, uh, Tsurpa Kumbangba. There was no way that even the tiniest amount of meat or the mere scent of alcohol could be in the encampment. His conduct was the perfection of purity and the power of his compassion extremely great. When people gathered from hundreds of thousands at most or no less than 500 at the least, the greatest developed shamat and insight, the middling developed certainty in the meaning of the words, and even the least committed to continually reciting mantras to encourage the people in the area to give up killing sentient beings and to recite the names of the Buddhas. This example of benefiting beings in many skippable ways is inconceivable. So during the time of the, uh, during the life of Rolpa Dorje, his, the liberation story is written by his direct disciples described this uh, uh, very clearly. So I think that these are a really good source. So, well, it says that the, that it's, we say that it's very strict that uh, this meat was strictly uh, prohibited in the encampment. So how strict was the encamp, uh, uh, how strict were the encampment's rules about meat? Well, I think if we look at the ninth Karmapa's rules for the encampment, we can understand this one. What it says in these, 
During the great festival of the encampment, meat may not be eaten. And so what this is saying, so no, forget about it, no, no, no need to mention the ordinary times, but even when we're having great festivals such as New Year's or when we're having uh, 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 larger meals, even during those times, meat was not allowed. It was served. And so it's not necessarily to mention about the uh, uh, ordinary times during the meat. Even at Losara, you were not allowed at all to bring meat, to serve meat. This is very clear that this was prohibited. It also says in the rules for the encampment, if meat were offered, actually make a hundredfold offering is were not allowed. Except at sacred sites and during rituals, one may not combine festivals and service at will and hold a Gana Chakra. During regular pujas also, there should be no dedicated meat. No one inside or outside the encampment should slaughter an animal or, or butcher it. This is extremely important. If anyone should do this, they must carry the come up and his heart sons. And if they still do not listen, they will be expelled from the encampment or given the lowest position, whichever is appropriate. And so the meaning of this is that If someone were to offer me to the Karmapa and his disciples, it would say that it says you could not include it, uh, that the meat could not be listed in the list of offerings. And you weren't allowed to include it in the offers the listed in uh, the offerings listed. Similarly, when the great encampment went to a sacred site or when there are special times such as the uh, celebrations of the anniversaries of the passings of um, uh, of the previous karmapas during those times when could had a gana chakra otherwise during regular pujas or or in other situations you couldn't just have say i'm going to have a gana chakra and have it you weren't allowed to just have a any gana chakra you wanted because you could uh, call something a gana chakra and eat meat so you weren't allowed to have gana chakras likewise no matter whether you're inside or outside the uh the encampment you couldn't slaughter any animal at all you also could not butcher a slaughter uh you couldn't butcher a slaughtered animal and this is extremely important and if there was someone who did this someone who actually did that or who or who had a, a, a connection or participated in it uh, they would have to have to take the res to take responsibility for the lives of the come up in his heart sons and if still did not listen they would be expelled from the this as for the encampment, they would not be allowed to remain within the encampment, or they would be de demoted to the lowest position. So whatever rank they would be at, they'd be demoted. And so this would be, uh, the, the punishment would be appropriate to what the circumstances in the time. Now, if we look at this time, if we think that if someone were expelled from the great encampment, they could go some else, but it was not so easy at that time. Once someone was expelled from the great encampment, Uh, no other Karmakaju monastery or association was, would be allowed to take care of that person. Not only was one ex, uh, expelled from the good encamp, uh, encampment, but you were also expelled from the Karmakaju. That's how it was. And so for these reasons, it was extremely strict. So what is the reason why uh, the meat was prohibited so strictly in the encampment? Well, there are many reasons, of course, but the main reason is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in the encampment, and so if you were to serve meat for them, there would be the danger that many sentient beings would be specifically killed for that purpose. And so that is, I think, the reason why uh, the meat was pro uh, prohibited in the encampment. 
And for, if you need to serve meat to that many people, you can't wait until there are enough corpses of dead animals. So you'd have to kill animals. And since, and therefore you'd be, and so then this be animal that is, uh, that is dedicated to them and this, or in terms of Vinay, this is called uh, uh, meat that is impure in the three ways. And so there's a great uh, difficulty or a great, uh, great harm to eating that. So I think that is the main reason why this was uh, prohibited. Now in particular, so we're speaking about the time of Mika Dorja. And so for that reason, So what is the example that Mika Dorje gave about meat? Uh, he especially strictly, um, you know, he had made especially strict, strict pro prohibitions against each one eating meat. Now, there are many reasons why he did this. Now, for one perspective, as, as I said before, when he was young, uh, the seventh karma, uh, Chodha Chazo had passed away. And from that time until Mika Dorja was enthroned in the great encampment, the rules and regulations of the past, of the previous time uh, all uh, were disregarded. And basically all the sentient beings that were, all the sentient, all the animals that were offered were killed uh, and eaten and their meat was eaten. And so that was the situation. And so when Mika Dorje actually saw these situations and re and when he realized what a difficulty it was bringing that Mikya Dorja himself uh, came to be a bit older and uh, uh, gained a bit of power himself he uh, strictly prohibited meat in the uh, in the encampment and was very strict and very insistent about it not only in the great encampment, he also he also encouraged people or he started a movement, uh, we would say these, they started a movement to uh, prevent the eating of meat uh, all over Tibet. The way we know this is that in the catalog of his collected works by the fifth Shama, Shama there is a text called A Letter to My Domestic Defenseless Mothers Primarily in the Land of Snows about how eating meat is wrong. So there's a text with this title uh, that was uh, like an announcement or a spread throughout all of Tibet. But we don't have this text right now, but I think that someday we will get a copy of it. Even though we don't know exactly what is said in the text, just seeing the title, what we can see, understand is that is that he is not only in the in the great encampment and the monasteries and uh, and monasteries being founded, he's uh, really uh, publicized widely that it was all over Tibet that eating meat is inappropriate. And so I think we can understand this just from the title. Also, uh, just give some uh, so citation as a support for this. There is Sangye Padru's commentary on the autobiographical versus good deeds, in which it says, no matter what region he traveled to, he skillfully prevented people from eating meat. In Kompa, because of the region, he was unable to prevent eating meat. And it was due to this that he did not go to al for alms in Kongpo, Mongol regions, or other regions where they eat only ate meat, it is said. So it's basically said, wherever he went, uh, wherever he, region he went to, he went in a very skillful way, not not forcefully, not uh, not uh, not for, not forcefully. He would prevent people from eating meat. But in Kongpo, because of the situation of the region, it was difficult to prevent people from eating meat. So in Kongpo and so you know some Mongol region. So Mongol regions here means means the northern regions and the region of Changtang. where there was uh, very little to eat other than meat. And so these are regions where one only ate meat. And so in those regions, 
he would not usually go for alms and so forth. And the reason he wouldn't go to is that because in those regions, they, they only ate meat, they didn't have anything else to eat. And so for, and, and so everyone would say that it was his, re, that this is the reason why he didn't go to these regions. So that is one thing. And no, it's not only that. And Mikyo Dorjan is in his, uh, we see this in the text that uh, Mikyo Dorji wrote himself. Now, there are many, uh, and he said, very uh, forceful uh, things about not eating meat. For example, from his uh, great commentary on the Vinaya, he wrote, further, if you put meat, alcohol, and so forth in the good or another certain kinds of tournament, you are not taking me as a teacher. You're not appropriate to be my disciple. You are not taking me as a guru. What the meaning of this is, when you're doing the Guthor or the Mahakala, when we have the great Mahakala pujas, if as for the, the materials, as the ingredients of the Purnas, if we actually put uh, meat, you're supposed to put actually meat and alcohol in this, but, but he said you're not allowed to do this. If you do this, then you're not taking me as my teacher, you're not considering my teacher, and I don't think of you as my students. And so you really need to think as this is basically what he's saying. So he's really saying very, uh, very forcefully. And so he spoke about this very strongly. And so it's, and so he's basically saying there's nothing else to say, but you had to, to keep it, to follow. The, so many people used to say this mood. Many people have said to me that. And said the Karmapa has said that if the Karmapa says that if you uh, don't give up meat, you're not a Kajupa, but this is just being too uh, too bold. And so they're saying this to me. And they're saying uh, they're saying that you say that if you don't give up um, um, meat, you're not a Kajupa. And it's not saying I'm saying that you're uh, eating uh, Kajupa. Kajupa. No, I can't decide whether someone else is a Kajupa. I don't have any ability to tell whether someone's Kajupa or not. But but in 2004, when I was uh, prevent, uh, saying the, uh, talking about preventing the eating meat, I quoted some, quoted some text of Mikha Dorje when he said that, and so the, he said that the Mikha Dorje and other ka, previous Kajus had said this. And so what people said, thought at that time is that I was saying this. And so they thought it was me who was saying that. So similarly, Mikyo Dorje also wrote in his hundred short instructions. Mm, what it says there. Here, it is important that once we go forth, we must give up the eight impure things. We must hold back from meat, alcohol, armors, weapons, riding animals and pack animals, business including interest, crops and houses, and milking and animal husbandry for even a minute. In particular, we should give up even looking at meat, alcohol, and weapons. If you do not give up these eight, you are not part of this Kaju lineage. So it is important to put this into practice. Well, this is what he says there. And so what this is saying is that is you need to give up these eight individual things. Fourth and become a monastic. Once you become a monastic, you must give up these eight things. And what are these eight things? Now, there are many different ways you can count uh, count, uh, count these, but for Mikyo Dorje, in his thought, it's the eight are uh, meat, alcohol, armors, weapons, riding animals and pack animals, business including interest, crops and houses, and milking and animal husbandry. So meat, alcohol, armor, weapons, animals, uh, bi uh, business including interest, crops and houses, farming, and milking and animal husbandry. Particularly for that you weren't even to look at uh, meat, alcohol, and weapons, you weren't even allowed to look at them. Forget about actually using them. You weren't allowed to look at them. And if you do if you do not give them up, you were not part of this Kaju image, so it is important to put them in, into practice. So the monastics who do, do not give these out are not part of the Kaju lineage, he is saying. So this is Mikyo Dorje's. It's not that Mikyo Dorje was just being audacious and saying this or making it up. So what is the source for saying that if you don't give up the uh, eight, you are um, not a Kajipa? 
he, he, there are there are quite citations that uh, Lord Gampopa himself cited. And what it says in the, the sutra that Gampopa cited is that so that in the future there will be a there will be students who give up the eight impure uh, things. And so for these are things that the followers of the Kaju must therefore follow. And for that reason, the uh, the followers of the uh, Kaju get the eight, the followers of the Kaju lineage must uh, must follow the, must give up these eight things. Now, uh, there are other ways of uh, there, there are many different ways that the eight things are uh, explained. Now, I haven't seen the other versions, but Mikhail Dorje explains them in the way that I've just mentioned. And so there are reasons for him to say this. It is not just that he was being making an order and being strict about it. And so not uh, that you're not allowed to do this because he said so. That's not how he said it. And so for that reason, in Tibet, because of the geography, it is extremely difficult to give up meat. In particular, during the time of the, uh, come up in Mikhail Dorje and our present Mikhail Dorje day, and our present way of living, the, this, uh, the, there's been huge changes in, in the lifestyle. This changed like 10 times or oh, 10 times as much. So like we looked at the time of, if you say in meat time, if you're saying uh, you shouldn't eat meat, then it's basically the same as you shouldn't eat. Because if you didn't eat meat, there wasn't a lot you could eat. I saw I saw an old book about, uh, a book about the list of Tibetan foods. When you looked at them, there were like a hundred different Tibetan foods. And 90 percent of them were all were all meat. The there are very few. Um, it's a, it's a, that's the actual situation. For example, forget about other situations. When I was young, when I was born in a nomad nomad family, and I was born in the nomad family. Then, if you didn't eat meat, then you would eat you would eat butter, and the the the, the Tibetan cheesecake and and drink butter, and drink milk. And other than that, there's nothing to eat. There were no vegetables. Okay, you'd eat sampa. So other than that, there really wasn't much else to do. It's really difficult, I think. And the actual fact is very difficult to do this. And because it's so difficult, uh, the masters of the of the great Tibetan master of the past did not uh, particularly. Um, say that you should stop eating meat. However, the pet master, the, the past Kaju masters uh, considered it very important to give up meat. And they spoke about the faults, uh, the problems of eating meat and drinking alcohol. And they spoke about the reasons for giving up meat. So I don't need to speak about them all today. I think we'll I'll speak about them tomorrow. Uh, I will speak about how the the uh, Kaju four, uh, f uh, f uh, f uh, forefathers uh, spoke about eat not eating meat, and how the masters of other lineages also spoke about not eating meat. So I think I can speak about those tomorrow. So next, what I'd like to speak about is meat that is pure in the three ways. So when we talk about meat that is has the threefold purity, there's something that actually can. There's some some debates about there. Some issues there. And I don't need to speak about the, the debates right now. First, I'll speak about the meat that is pure in the three ways. And, and then after that, we uh, won't need to debate it. We'll just... Uh... Now, the, the meat that is pure in the three ways is just taught in the Vinaya. And since it's taught in the Vinaya, so I thought I'd speak about this. I almost forgot. Okay, now, now in Sanskrit and Pali and Chinese and Tibetan, there are the Vinaya scriptures of various schools, of various schools. And so there are several different schools, scriptures, uh, and if we look at them, 
that our teacher, the Bhagavan Buddha, paid great attention to the food and conduct of his students in the monastic community. He gave them a lot of advice. In particular, uh, food is a daily necessity for anyone, for any being that is living. You cannot do without it. And since it is a necessity, there's no choice but to eat. And since you have to eat, then at that time in India, There are, there are many different religions or many different philosophical schools, and many of those religions considered practicing austerities to be extremely important. And the traditions of practicing severe austerities regarding food that would be hard for ordinary people to practice. But the Buddha himself, before he achieved awakening, uh, practiced austerities for six years as he had like total experience of practicing experience and because he had that experience he knew that liberation cannot be achieved through austerities alone and he himself stopped practicing austerities and after he stopped practicing austerities he taught his many his students and in particular his monastic students he said that they should not have a livelihood that is so austere that the body cannot tolerate it, that the body cannot uh, cannot uh, cannot bear it. So we should not have that sort of life. Uh, life. Nor should there be such a luxurious life so that one becomes careless. Instead, he, uh, he instructed students on how to live a lifestyle that does not fall into either extreme and established codes related to this. In particular, it's necessary to have food every day to continue living, so you have to eat. But that food, well, we should think about that food as medicine and eat it at the right time and in moderation. And if we were to eat just like dogs or pigs, that wouldn't be okay. And the food that we eat is that the, for the food, the monastics should go out on alms rooms on every day and eat whatever the faithful donors give. Other than that, they should not choose which one they like better or not, or eat food that is too elaborate or store food and so forth. None of that was allowed. So, so I think that the meat that is pure in the three ways, I think, came around for uh, such, such reasons and such uh, situations. I think this is very clear. This is because in general, what we can, what we can, what we should, what we must understand is that from ancient times until present, present, uh, India has always been the the country where there's largest numbers of vegetarians. It's a, uh, it's the, it is the uh, the country where the most people do not uh, do not eat meat. In particular, the the, ca the Brahmin caste was at that time considered the highest caste. And most people in the Brahmins caste at that time did not uh, did not eat meat. Now, some scholars say uh, say that in the past uh, Brahmins did eat meat, but later they didn't. So this is uh, so this, people do this, say this, but in our Vinaya texts, uh, it seems from reading those that the that the high caste Brahmins did not eat meat. So even when the uh, monastics went on their alms round. I think there are very few people who offered them meat because they're in the region. There are just there are just so few people who eat meat. So when you went for uh, went to that region for alms, there are few people who would give meat. Likewise, when the uh, uh, when the uh, when the monastics went on their alms round, they didn't only go to the high caste households for alms. They also would go to the doors of, of low caste households and request food and um, and ask for alms. And these lower castes, if they were a family where they ate meat, it's possible that they might eat. And if they offered meat, if we talk about it fundamentally, when you accept alms, you have to take the alms, you have to accept the alms. And if you didn't take the alms, then the donor might think they're being insulted or think they're not being given an opportunity to gather merit. So that is how people would see it. 
And so for that reason, so the Buddha, the Bhagavan Buddha at that time was different uh, than any than the others. He said that it, there's no consider, do not consider either costs or high or low, and thought that uh, there needed uh, connections needed made made people of every level of society. So fundamentally, whether whether they're rich or not, one had to eat whatever food was uh, the donors offered, and was not a made to choose. I'm going to eat this, but not eat that. The the monastics who didn't have a choice to make the uh, have the we're not allowed to make that individual choice. Now, does this mean that according to the Vinayad that, that the monastics may eat any meat that is offered to them? It's probably not that sort of situation. That is not how it is. And how we know this is that in in Tibetan we have the with the Uttara Granta Vinaya text to the Mulasa Vastavada tradition. Now I don't need to say what it says, but the main point of this is that and there are several types of meat that one should not eat, and such as the flesh of some types of birds, including owls, of reptiles and amphibians, such as toads, of the, the meat of carnivores, such as lions, tigers, and bears. This type, these types of meat were not allowed to eat. Not only were you not allowed to eat those types of meat, you weren't allowed to eat the fat or the, or the, um, or the other juices of these inappropriate meats. And also raw meat, it was not allowed to be eaten, and you were not, and the monastics were not allowed to eat meat killed specifically for the monastic sake. And so many of these, so there's other, there's several of these uh, types of meat um, were not allowed to be eaten at all, whether or not they were pure in the three ways or not. There's no need to look at whether they were pure in the three ways or not. They're just not allowed to eat them. But if the, if the meat was uh, allowed, allowed, it's not in that list of uh, inappropriate meats. If it is an appropriate meat, you should first examine whether it is pure in the three ways. And if it is pure in the three ways, you can eat it. If it is not pure in the three ways, then you may not eat it. And so for that reason, you'd have to first examine whether it is pure in the three ways or not. And if not, if you just do whatever you want and eat it without caring, there's the same, uh, there's the danger that you have the offense of eating impure meat. And so for that reason, and so you need to think about whether the meat was pure in the three ways or not. Now the question is, who does this determination of whether meat is pure in the three ways apply to? Because the Buddha had both monastic and lay students. So, so is this determination of meat being pure in the three ways, is this for monastics? Or is it for the lay students? Or is it for both monastic and lay students? If you ask this, it's primarily for the monastic. And this is very, uh, uh, it's, it's clear that this, uh, so, however, in these days, uh, there are some scriptures of the Vinaya from different schools that we still can read that state that even people with the lay precepts should not eat, or should eat only meat that is pure in the three ways. But in general, in terms of the Vinaya, in general, it the a pure a three um, meat that is pure in the three ways primarily a rule and a presentation for uh, the monastics and so this is uh, quite clear <laughs>